he has impacted so many different areas of the marketing field and the business field. Any criteria in terms of research output, recognition, citations, influence, the amount of books and our journal articles, he's up there. In the field of marketing, I put him at number one because I think Dad has touched so many different aspects of not just the field of marketing, but the field of management, the field of international business, global development and global economics. If all he ever did was academics, he'd be one of the great leaders of the last 60 years. If all he did was help create future business leaders and help the governance and, and the strategy of corporations, he'd be one of the great corporate thinkers and, and leaders of the last 50 years. But also he's had this profound impact on public policy and government. One of the things that really separates, um, you know, Jag Sheth, I think, from, you know, every other scholar that I've ever come across is he's, he's really a year or two in front of the field in terms of his innovative ideas. And, and, and that's been throughout his entire career. I don't think there's probably any field that I engage in that he wouldn't have thoughts about because he's probably done some research related to it. In this latest episode of The American Journey, we share the extraordinary story of Indian American scholar, educator, and marketing guru, Jagdish Sheth. A towering figure in the academic discipline of marketing, Sheth has a body of work that spans six decades and cuts across several fields, ranging from consumer psychology and relationship marketing to global competitive strategy and geopolitics. Sheth, the Charles H. Kelstad Professor of Business at Emory University's Goizueta Business School, has been equally successful in the corporate world. Over the years, he has served on the boards of more than half a dozen companies and consulted for some of the largest American companies. Jagdish Jag Sheth was born in 1938 in Burma, then a British colony. He was the youngest of six children of Nanchan Jiraj Sheth and Diwali Nanchant Sheth. The Sheths were rice traders who moved to Burma a few years earlier, seeking better business opportunities. However, the outbreak of the Second World War had a cataclysmic effect on the family. In 1940, Japan rolled over Burma, and all minorities had to get out. And we come from a small village in Kutch, Gujarat. So we went back to Kutch in Mundra, Last boat we caught, left everything behind. My father had a clinical depression. For four years, he sat in a corner and did not want to talk to anybody. The family struggled mightily for the next eight years. The school I went was a one-room school in the old days. Each bench is a class. The father and the son ran the school. And we must be about 40, 50 students in the class. My sisters nurtured me quite a lot. Uh, they all worked making pickles or embroidery to get something. And uh, some of the jewelry that my mother had uh, got with her, uh, she began to pawn and, and get some cash. Since economic opportunities were scarce in the Kutch region, the family of eight moved to multiple cities across India. We left Kutch in 1947 to go to Chennai. So we were in Chennai for a while. We were trying to settle, and we went to different places. Uh, then we went to Baroda, uh, and from Baroda, Borivali in Bombay, and then ultimately back to Chennai in 1952. In Chennai, a southeastern port city, then known as Madras, the family started a small manufacturing business producing jewelry boxes. Their business was uh, getting the materials, creating the boxes for the jewelry, and then selling those to the jewelers, who would then put the jewelry in it and then sell it along with the jewelry. So it was a very, very little business, very cottage business. Jeff spent his formative years in Madras, a city known for education, culture, and progressive politics. After graduating from high school in 1955, he enrolled for a two-year intermediate program. I really enjoyed uh, accounting. But I, my love and my passion is for history. 
I studied history, accounting, and statistics. He passed the intermediate program with the highest marks in the entire state. His eldest brother wanted him to come and work in the uh, jewelry making business with him and uh, only relented to allow him to go to college because he was such a good student and because his second brother said, he's a good student, you should allow him to go on to school. Since he was very good at accounting, a career option Chef considered was chartered accountant, equivalent to CPA in the United States. And then I went to Loyola College in a special program. Uh, my major was income tax, become honors, three-year program. After completing the bachelor's degree program in 1960, Chef decided to apply for an MBA program in the United States. And again, his elder brother said, what's the purpose of this? Right, we need you to be of help to the family and come and work in the business. And uh, between the, el the second brother and my dad's uh, convincing of, oh, I'll go to the U.S., I'll do an MBA, I'll learn all these things, I'll help to mechanize the business so I can come back, so he, was, he was allowed to go. Even though he was accepted by multiple schools, Seth chose to attend the University of Pittsburgh. His tuition was covered by the university, but Chef still needed to come up with money to pay for travel and living expenses. I had 5,000 savings in my brother's company for work that I was doing, setting aside money. So 5,000 rupees, which was at a fixed exchange rate, five rupees per dollar, about $1,000. And then I had to borrow 10,000 rupees from different families. At the University of Pittsburgh, Chef was the only foreign student in his MBA class. It was not easy adapting to America especially its weather. Nonetheless, he thoroughly enjoyed the classes and the academic atmosphere. So he would write me all about, you know, how the United States is, you know, how is the education system, how the weather is, the weather is doing so bad over here. The MBA program opened a new frontier for Chef, working with professors like John Howard, who would later become his mentor and co-author. The young Indian scholar began reading the books of Sigmund Freud, and Abraham Maslow, and taking an interest in behavioral sciences. Suddenly, I got turned on by psychology because I had never known Freud or anybody in my age. We didn't talk in India any one of those names. And I said, this is interesting. I did know what I wanted to know what motivates people. And a clever idea that Jack had was to let's use uh, uh, new immigrants to the United States who really weren't familiar with um, any, of the, any of the brands uh, when they came to the U.S. As, as, a, as a subject pool to really understand how people learn about brands and become uh, uh, brand loyal. Two papers on behavioral sciences that Seth wrote for his class garnered attention within the academic circles and showed early signs of his huge potential. In a way, some of the fundamental works, which were instrumental in launching his academic career, were done during this period. Among them was honing his theorizing capability, a prerequisite for an academic. Around the same time, he started examining institutions, such as government and religion, and also began working on a seminal book with his mentor, John Howard, a Harvard-trained economist. And we began to write this theory of buyer behavior. Contrary to economic expectations, we found that the consumers get habituated. They buy out of habit, not based upon calculations, pros and cons, plus and minus, uh, trade-offs, which is the typical economic theory. So he went there, did his MBA, and just fell in love. Right? Fell in love with all of the learning that he was doing, all of the new concepts and ideas and thoughts. That led him to the bombshell that he, he dropped on his own family and on my mom, which was, I like it here, I want to stay. I want to do my PhD. Seth registered for Ph.D. at the University of Pittsburgh, but he also had a small personal matter to take care of. Prior to coming to Pittsburgh, he had fallen in love with a beautiful Gujarati girl at a literary organization he had co-founded in Madras. He wanted to bring Madhuri Shah to the U.S. and marry her. When I met him the first time, I had no idea that he's leaving to go to the United States. I guess by the time I decided, we decided, you know, that we should be getting married. Uh, then he tells me that he's planning to go to the United States. And I said, well, that's fine too, you know, if you, and he says, he's just going for two years. 
I said, two years is not too, much, too long. I can wait that long. I could not go back, so I said, can you come and marry me? Now, you don't send your girl without engagement. And in our culture, engagement is tantamount to marriage. Because I could not spend a semester just traveling, and I had no money also. I had barely made it here. Uh, so given that uh, they had uh, my engagement in my absence with my photo. Madhu flew to the United States after a modest engagement ceremony. The couple was married at the landmark Heinz Chapel in Pittsburgh on December 22, 1962. The wedding was officiated by a visiting professor from India. So I had my host family become my parent surrogates. No money to invite anybody. My professor, uh, who was assigned to each foreign student, he and his wife became her parent surrogates. My best man was an American because there are no other Indians there in my class. Very good man, David Miller, still uh, good friends after so many years. Big pictures of my mom in her sari and garlands and all of the, the look and feel of an Indian wedding uh, in an American chapel. Right, what an amazing uh, situation to be in. In the spring of 1963, the University of Pittsburgh, which was a private university, faced a financial collapse, forcing many high-profile professors to leave the school. John Howard moved to Columbia University in New York. He did not want to stay. He said, come along with me. I have no idea how to be recruited. I said, sure, perfect, why not? He actually rented the apartment for me ahead of time. In October 1963, Sheth joined Howard at Columbia as a research associate at an annual salary of $9,000. His main job was to develop the theory of buyer behavior, completing chapters and reviewing with doctoral students. In the meantime, the chefs welcomed their first child, daughter Reshma. In the fall of 1965, Sheth joined the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston as an assistant professor. Even though he had not completed his PhD yet, MIT had been helping the government of India to set up a world-class management school in the eastern city of Calcutta. MIT would give them the curriculum, the design, the faculty. Sheth joined MIT in a tenured track position. The arrangement was that he would be available to teach at the new Indian Institute of Management during certain semesters. So I can teach one semester in Kolkata and one semester in Cambridge. That was the idea. Sheth submitted his doctoral thesis in late 1965 and received his PhD the next year. In 1967, he published his first major paper, a review of buyer behavior in the journal Management Science, which was very well received. Then we got a major grant on our theory at Columbia University. So Columbia University said, come back. Even though his time at MIT was very productive, Sheth could not resist an offer from Columbia to return as an assistant professor. In addition to teaching classes, he also wanted to work with Howard to complete the book. So I only stayed in uh, MIT one or two years, that's it. If I stayed one more year, I would have never left MIT or Cambridge, Massachusetts or Boston. Now back in the New York area, the Shess had their second child, son, Rajin, who was born in February 1967. By the end of the year, Sheth finally had the opportunity to go to India and teach at IMM Calcutta. It was an experience he relished. In 1969, shortly before returning to the United States, he left Columbia for the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana, one of the largest public universities in the country. He joined the university as an associate professor of business, a tenured position. I have to Illinois, mostly for psychology department that brilliant psychologist, and I liked their work. And I said, I would like to come there. Once we moved to Illinois, that's really where Dad's star power started. He started teaching multivariate statistics, of all things, to corporations. He started teaching to AT&T. And from AT&T, he started teaching other companies as well. And then he really became recognized, not just for consumer behavior, but also for his ability to present across multiple business concepts and platforms. The Theory of Buyer Behavior, the book Sheth had been collaborating with John Howard for seven years, was finally published in 1969. It instantly became a classic. 
transforming the discipline of marketing from a product-driven field to a consumer-driven one. Or if I'm a consumer behavior researcher and I'm thinking of what's the foundations of consumer behavior research, Howard Chef theory is in that mix of uh, sort of the fundamental, you know, theoretical contributions to how consumers make, um, make decisions. Definitely the theory of buyer behavior is what catapulted him to the next level. Even 30 years later when I went to do my doctorate, it was a book that everyone who teaches consumer behavior says all the students have to read. Um, so it was very eye-opening, obviously very complex theory, and yet simplistic in many ways. So if you're trying to do work based on that book, there are a lot of different avenues, different paths that you can go down. So not only was it seminal in terms of laying the seeds of theory that hadn't been developed before, but it also allowed people to take that theory and kind of expand upon it. So if you take a look at how many scholars were spawned um, as a result of that book, it's pretty mind-boggling. Even five decades after it was published, the theory of buyer behavior continues to be influential in the academic world. In 2020, the book's 50th anniversary was celebrated with the publication of a special edition. Schiff had been teaching executive classes to earn some extra money almost since the beginning of his academic career. Now with the publication of The Buyer Behavior, Schiff's brand began to take off. The newfound popularity enabled him to land consulting jobs with some of the largest companies in the world. After marriage, uh, we decided Madhu will not be a uh, professional. She was a teacher, she would not. She would be homemaker, I would be the breadwinner which means it's my responsibility economically to get the money. And so I had to do a second job, which is this executive education. Over the decades, he has worked for roughly 60 major corporations across several industries. His clients range from packaged goods companies such as General Foods, Procter & Gamble, and Unilever to electronics manufacturers like Philips. And I evolved from teaching technical courses to more strategy, ultimately eventually getting into true advising about the future of the company itself. So I've been involved heavily in uh, like, when do you exit the whole corporation? Very confidential. It's just one-on-one -on -one conversation with the chairman and you learn quite a lot, how do you become a trusted advisor? In the early 1980s, Sheth began studying one particular sector of the economy very closely, the telecom industry, which was then undergoing massive structural changes. In 1984, the century-old behemoth Bell System was broken up into seven small companies known as Baby Bells, and AT&T, the parent company, relinquished the control of the Bell operating companies. The same year, Sheff left the University of Illinois reluctantly to accept a position at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. At USC, he created a center for telecommunication management to foster a clear understanding of the evolving industry. The center served as a perch that would allow Sheth to interact with top executives of an industry that became part of America's critical infrastructure. Among companies he worked closely with was AT&T. AT&T, like UPS and others, were, grew out of engineers, <clears throat> engineering bases, and innovation often happened as new capabilities uh, reaching out but most of those companies do not know how to position for sale, do not know how to position for service. He had an extraordinary impact on shifting a technology company to be more sensitive and uh, sensitive in a different way to the consumer marketplace. In 1991, Sheth decided to leave USC and join Emory University. Founded more than 150 years ago, the Atlanta-based private university was in the middle of rebranding itself as a top-notch university, a sort of Harvard of the South. One of the primary reasons Sheth moved to Atlanta was because it was where his client Bell South was headquartered. Bell South was very nurturing, and they said, we st Los Angeles is too far, can you come here? Every week I was flying out 2,000 miles, Chicago or New York or Atlanta, or, you know, Texas someplace, and I found that I just had no life. Given that, I decided to switch to the East Coast. At Emory, the impact of Chef's hiring was felt almost immediately. 
I came to Emory a little over 30 years ago, and then uh, Jack Sheff was our first major hire, someone who really was on the global stage. It was a span in our evolution <clears throat> where we were known very well in the U.S., but not globally. So it was very important to bring in someone of, of his eminence. He has had a profound impact on the school, on the university, on the projection of the university to the business community and uh, international reputation as well. When he came, we were able with his, again, his eminence and his magnetic personality and his reputation for being a caring mentor to attract some of the best young marketing professionals in the world, marketing professors, to such an extent that we have built up what remains one of the best marketing academic departments in the world. But he is the father of that. He was um, one of the main reasons why I, I really wanted to come to Emory uh, for my PhD. I got to know him fairly well and he shaped a lot of my interests and, and ways of thinking. Outside of academics, Sheth's success in the field of executive education made him an enormously sought-after consultant to many U.S. and global companies. Besides major telecom players such as AT&T, Bell South, and Lucent, the list of corporate giants he worked with as a consultant since the 1980s include General Motors, Whirlpool, Home Depot, Delta, and UPS. By the 1990s, with his reputation as a consultant growing and stardom in the academic field rising, Sheth began receiving invitations to join corporate boards. In 1994, he joined the board of Norstan, then one of the largest independent systems integration companies. Over the next two and a half decades, he would serve on the boards of more than half a dozen diverse range of corporations. Among them was Wipro, one of India's most valuable companies, which has a market cap of more than $52 billion and global workforce of 220,000 people. Sheth served on the Indian conglomerate's board for 19 years. His association with Wipro's billionaire founder, Azim Pringi, had begun in the mid-1980s when the company was predominantly a consumer products manufacturer. Azim Pringi and I have been in knowing each other for more than 35 years. We started uh, in 1985 when I became advisor to Santur brand of soaps in Bombay, the headquarters of Bombay, and the rest is the history into IT industry, into infrastructure, whatever they've done. And we still are good friends. Sheth says his experience in boards have enriched his academic career. I feel so blessed that I got on the boards of companies. As a board member, as an academic, most of my colleagues would be other industry leaders usually, CEOs of other companies. As an academic, again, I would be the thought leader because it gives you the panorama of challenges and problems business institutions face. And you are constantly struggling with the dilemma, whether those are moral dilemmas, ethical dilemmas, or dilemmas of just internal issues, whatever they are. In recent years, Sheth has left boards and cut down on most of the corporate engagements to spend more time on philanthropy. But he continues to wield an outsized influence on the discipline of marketing. Now in his 84th year, Sheth's intellectual output remains as impressive as it ever has been. There's a, a preconception that maybe people lose their creativity as they get older. Jack Sheth when we had a 70th birthday party for him, who would have known that some of his greatest contributions would be coming when he had a 75th, 80th, you know? Fortunately, uh, and we all hope he remains in great health, he takes very good care of himself. I'm very interested to see in the 90s what new, big picture, but very forward-looking contribution he comes up with. Besides the theory of buyer behavior, Sheth has authored or co-authored nearly 30 books and over 200 papers. Because of their applicability in the real world, many of his books have become popular, used not just by the academic community, but also by businesses and even governments. The Rule of Three, which was co-authored with fellow Indian American scholar Rajenda Sisodia and published in 2001, is one such book. Rule of Three book has become universal reading now all over the world. It is used by Justice Department for 
monopoly rights and sort of anti-competitive behavior. It is used by companies in testimonies. And any kind of a merger activity, activity, rule of three seems to be an underlying phenomenon. Another book that has had a huge impact on the industry is The Four A's of Marketing, which was also written in collaboration with Sisodia. The book describes four core values that matter most to customers, acceptability, affordability, accessibility, and awareness. Before I came to market, to the academic world, I worked at the Coca-Cola company many years. We used things like uh, the frameworks, like the four A's. And I thought that framework was internal. Dr. Chet's work, in uh, particular on the four A's and, and many other in consumer behavior, in consumer relationships, he has impacted so many different areas of the marketing field and the business field, which I started to realize actually it was his thinking that was guiding the thinking at the Coca-Cola company. Um, it was quite a realization for me. Even though they are written for specific audiences, Seth's books have a universal appeal. In the northern climates, he points out, you need to have individual aggressiveness in order to survive. And you need to have competitiveness. But as you go further south, cultures tend to be more collectivist. And there's less uh, emphasis on, are you happy as a person? Because that would be an individualist judgment. There's less, comp there's less emphasis on com competitiveness. The hallmarks of Chef's scholarship are his extraordinary ability to analyze issues from up close, as well as from a distance his capacity to cut through the present and see the future, and his ability to communicate across disciplines. It is these qualities that have made him such an influential figure, both in the academic and business world. Jack is one of those people that can see the small picture and the big picture in one conversation. He flies at 50,000 feet and then at 50 feet in a second meaning he can give you that context and the hysterical context and then he can bring it down to, with an example that's very tangible about a decision you made yesterday. And I think that's, that's what makes him uh, also very, very unique. One of the things that really separates, um, you know, Jag Sheth, I think from, uh, you know, every other scholar that I've ever come across is he's, he's really a year or two in front of the field in terms of his innovative ideas. And, and, and that's been throughout his entire career. Sometimes I call myself a futurist because I really imagine the future based upon trends or insights. He had conceived of the idea of rule of three before anyone could have conceived of that. He conceived of the field of relationship marketing. So he, in these regards, he's a very big thinker, but he's a very forward thinker. He was, he was so far ahead, it might even have taken people a number of years to, to even understand the, the broad canvas that he had foreseen. Jeff also has a remarkable intellectual range. I don't think there's probably any field that I engage in that he wouldn't have thoughts about because he's probably done some research related to it. And the range of his work, I think is second to none, honestly. And if he talks about across any industry, he has deep knowledge, deep understanding of industry dynamics. Uh, he can speak longitudinal, like where things came from and how they evolved. He can talk about the customer side and the production side, right? the supply side and the demand side. His understanding of business in a holistic way, and not only as an economic activity, as a cultural activity, as a political activity. Like most great scholars, Sheth has exceptional talent to explain complex issues in plain language. I think the theories are good when they combine a very deep understanding of a phenomenon with very simple ways of explaining it. And when you hear Jack explain the rule of three and he starts going through example after example and kind of the logic behind it, somehow it starts building into you that this is explaining a lot of different industry dynamics with a relatively simple concept. Chet says he would not have achieved the kind of success he has had in his career without the help he received from a number of individuals throughout his life. And those who nurtured him include his five older siblings who provided him with a support system early in his life, and his professor, mentor, and co-author John Howard, who was instrumental in launching his academic career.
However, the one central figure who has been anchoring Seth's life in the past 60 years has been his wife, Madhu. In his autobiography, The Accidental Scholar, Seth attributed his success to the unconditional support, love, and partnership of Madhu, calling her his backbone. He calls her mother, you know. So we all call her mother. <laughs> That's the way. My mom and dad have the best relationship of any couple I've ever met now. <laughs> he basically listens to everything she says. She gives him all kinds of suggestions and he says, yes, Madhu, makes sense. His famous line is the best victories are in surrender. Besides our common culture, Jains, Gujarati, belief system, one thing more common between my wife and I independently is that she has the same obsession to learn. In her family and friend circles, Madhu is known as a gracious hostess and an avid gardener. When they come to her house, everyone expects a feast, and of course, they get it. So, um, she's a great cook. Madhu is always there. Whatever needs to be done, whether it's in the kitchen, whether it's in the house, always present, always helpful, always loving, always caring, and a lady that one can model oneself after. She has learned everything about the trees and the flowers and everything. Our yard, every month has a new set of flowers. She attends two garden clubs. We have two women's garden clubs here. And she is in both of them. Oh, she always has a beautiful garden. And um, we're trying to compete. We're two houses across the street. But I don't know if we can get there. She's, she always has beautiful flowers. And, Things are blooming all the time. Madhu is also actively involved in the local Jain community. In fact, she was instrumental in the establishment of the Jain Society of Greater Atlanta, which runs a sprawling temple and religious school. She's very passionate about creating a Jain community here. She's the first woman president of a North American Jain center. She has invested her time, talent, and the treasure. Uh, she bought two lots, two houses, tore down the houses, created a land, 3.5 3 acres, built the Jain Center, now the temple. While Madhu and Jag have divergent interests, one common passion the couple shares is philanthropy. At least 50% of their wealth they have given away. And I think that their plan is to give away probably 90 plus percent of their wealth. And as my dad likes to say, it's a lot more fun to do while you're alive than, than after you're dead. So, so they've been very active in doing that over the last probably couple of decades. Giving back is always a natural tendency. In my view, I think it is as innate as anything, like hunger, thirst. Now I started thinking about that being an immigrant to what can I do to America because it has done so well for me. India the same way, of course. I mean, I can't get world-class free education like what you got. People like us should contribute back to the society. Paying forward in many ways is an obligation you inherit. In the past two decades, the chefs have supported dozens of local, national, and international causes through two foundations. One of them, the Madhuri and Jagdish Seth Foundation, is primarily focused on generating scholars and leaders in its discipline, marketing. And we do enormous set of activities through that foundation. Our uh, crown jewel would be a annual doctoral consortium where about 110 universities are invited to send one doctoral student, they're all future scholars, top one, and about 150 faculty who are the best scholars come together, mentoring each other, presentations and it is hosted by one of the top universities. So it'll be Northwestern University, Notre Dame, uh, Wharton School, Chicago. In India, the foundation supports the Academy of Indian Marketing, which was launched by Sheth in collaboration with a prominent Indian marketing scholar. Where I've been able to motivate uh, about 34 top business schools and management institutes, both government and non-government, to join in the consortium with a focus of increasing the scholarship of Indian faculty in India. My message is very simple. In my generation, I had no opportunities to do research. So I had to come out 
or when I came out, my potential was realized. The couple launched another foundation, the Sheth Family Foundation, to support causes outside of marketing and academic fields. Its mission is to contribute to Indian cultural activities, anything to do India, and to a local community like Atlanta. About 100 different charities we contribute. One of the signature programs of the foundation is a lecture series on India studies at Emory University. When they do special lecture series, sometimes it's dance, sometimes it's medicine, um, Destination India, we've learned a great deal. We've seen dancers that I have never seen before and that I don't think anybody else has. And they bring the culture and they bring it that you, it's inspirational that you want to go to India to see it. Another cause the chefs are promoting through their foundation is Jainism. It really is a religion of self-discovery, self-improvement, uh, it says that that's really more important than anything else. And learning, which is the passion I have. Jag and Madhu were part of a group of donors who set up an endowment for postdoctoral fellowship at Emory University's Candler School of Theology in 2021. Today, all Christian priests, before they become priests, go through a master's program or a PhD. And actually, they are now taught religions of the world, not just Christianity. But Jainism is conspicuously absent. Jainism is becoming from a, what we call a footnote religion. So now we are creating a program whereby a typical class of priest, future priest, will be immersed like nine days or so learning about Jainism, both as a philosophy as well as in fact on the ritual side. I tell you, we are both so excited because it impacts now brings Jainism into mainstream Western world, as opposed to Jainism only for Jains, or only in India. When I came to this campus in 1976, this was a Christian Southern University. There were barely a few blacks and barely a few Jews. They have uh, brought Indian cultural and Jain uh, studies to campus. Since they moved to Emory in the early 1990s, the chefs have also been a big part of the Indian American community in the Atlanta area. The society in Atlanta has been devoid or bereft of a person who they can look up to in terms of leadership, in terms of uh, guardianship, in terms of hand-holding. And that void has been filled by Professor Shed. During his six decades of professional and academic life, Sheth has received several accolades from dozens of prominent trade groups, institutions, and nations. In 2020, India, the country of his birth, honored Sheth with the Padma Bhushan Award, the third highest civilian award in the nation. Padma Bhushan Award has been a significant recognition in my life. It's more than most of the awards I have won. Every community thought it was their award. My academic colleagues, the Jain community, Atlanta community, and any community, we say this award is more meaningful to everybody, not just to me. And that just really, really meant so much to me. Over nearly six decades, Jagdish Sheth has built a remarkable legacy in multiple spheres. If you get in one room all the people that he mentored when they were PhD students, and you see the careers they've had, as professors, and then you see their students. There's kind of the Jag Chef pyramid, uh, and and as a teacher and as a mentor and as an advisor, you you could gather probably one third of the world's great marketing professors, and they have a tie to Jag Chef. He has impacted so many different areas of the marketing field and the business field. Almost any criteria in terms of research output, recognition, citations influence the amount of books and our journal articles, he's up there. He is probably with Phil Cutler, the other only person that comes close to you know, Jack's accomplishments. In the field of marketing, I put him at number one because I think Dad has touched so many different aspects of not just the field of marketing, but the field of management, the field of international business, 
the you know global uh, development and global economics. Jack Sheth, if, if anything, is someone who straddled three worlds. Academics, of course, one of the leading professors of our time, one of the leading authors of our time. But he's also very much straddled the world of policy and practical policy, an advisor to governments, governments that have helped lift their nations from poverty to very high level uh, economic and socioeconomic status like Singapore. And third, he's had such an amazing impact in corporate life training future corporate leaders, being on the board of some of the great companies of our time, like Wipro. If all he ever did was academics, he'd be one of the great leaders of the last 60 years. If all he did was help create future business leaders and help the governance and, and the strategy of corporations, he'd be one of the great corporate thinkers and, and leaders of the last 50 years but also he's had this profound impact on public policy and government. I don't think that I have met a better mentor, a uh, better colleague uh, from a scholarship standpoint, a better uh, administrative influence and policy and reasoned policy than uh, Professor Jag Sheth. Jeff himself considers the students, academics, and corporate leaders that he mentored and helped develop over the decades to be his greatest legacy. I think my legacy would be more about someone who unlocked the potential of so many, either on a one-on-one -on -one mentoring or influencing in the class and inspiring them to do something. I think it's the ultimate purpose of human being. How do you make ordinary people extraordinary? And how do you unlock their potential? If you take a grain of wheat, an agricultural commodity, and make it into a loaf of bread, the value add is only three times. If you take a rough diamond and polish it, and a good diamond cutter will get the brilliance out to about 15 to 20 times, an industrial raw material. But if you take a human being, mentor, nurture, educate, give opportunities, the value add is infinite. Most of us don't know our own potential. It is somebody else who recognizes that, nurtures that, and makes actually realize your potential. I myself have got the same way. My potential was realized by my family, my sisters surprisingly, and then eventually my brothers. In this country, my mentor, professor, enormous and my potential was unlocked the same way. The only expression I can make about my journey is how blessed I am. Somebody who came from a merchant community, becoming a refugee in Burma, probably I would not have studied beyond grade school, managed a little panwala shop and becoming a professor. So from Panwala to Professor journey is just incredible, which means that my own potential I did not realize, but somebody out there realized and gave me the opportunities. So I feel blessed.